Well, good morning, good morning. A little better. Come on, give me a little more than that. Good morning, good morning. Has it been good to you today? That's the kind of mood I'm in. I'm trying to find it now. It's been a long week. <laughs> My pop told me I better preach today, so I took out the handheld. This is the preaching microphone. There will be no teaching today. Uh, very special welcome to our first time guests. We're so glad you're here. Uh, thank you for entrusting a part of your journey with Jesus to this place. For those of you who are joining us online for the first time, uh, good morning to you as well. Go ahead and hit that online guest card. We would love to connect you with one of our pastors and see how we can be a part of your story. Uh, also, before we jump in, I want to go ahead and dismiss those of you who are doing Growth Track Step 2 today. Uh, if you haven't been through Growth Track Step 2, then uh, today is your day. All right. So uh, our Growth Track team is waiting to receive you. If you don't know, we switched to doing Growth Track during the gatherings uh, so that we can make an ease of access for everybody. You know, somebody's going to come at 10. They're not going to stay for Growth Track to after 11 30 what's up my guy your work looking good um so glad that we are able to offer that now and uh and if you haven't been through it yet go through it discover your purpose that's what step two is is to help you discover your purpose or affirm some of the gifts that god has given you and the last thing i'll say before we jump in uh, i'll repeat this quote i heard uh, that i shared with you last week that culture is what you create or allow culture is what you create or allow so I just want you to celebrate yourself many of you who were early and expecting today because you are creating the culture that you want to be a part of and I promise you it's going to fundamentally shift the experience not only for you but for everybody who comes to be a part of this spiritual family the last time we were together we saw that brokenness when we were in Acts chapter 2 there were the end we saw that brokenness is healed when Jesus power is unleashed whether he is present physically or not we said that if these three things practicing the rhythms of Jesus seizing every opportunity and speaking the name of Jesus that was my favorite part become a part of our rhythm of life then we will become a community of healers we will see see many things in our cities made whole we will be a part of a sweeping community transformation can i get a good amen on that today we're going to see that that there was a way for us to be faithful representatives of jesus and so if you want to if you would open up your paper or digital bible to acts chapter 3 we're going to start in verse 11 we're going to work through verse 26 but i'm not going to read all of those to you right now because you know that's a lot to be reading but uh starting in verse 11 if you want to follow along with bible notes or get the bulletin for this week hit that qr code on the screen you'll find both of them there and i promise you they will be a benefit to you while he clung to peter and john all the people ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's portico, utterly astonished. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people, fellow Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though our own power or piety made this man walk? The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name itself, has made this man strong whom you see and know and the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all the word of the Lord and if you would say with me thanks be to God father we ask now in the name of Jesus that you would speak through your word that we would hear the call Yahweh the voice of God that can only be heard in the gathered assembly of his people that we would be fundamentally transformed no matter where we are in our journey with toward or even away from Jesus that we would know at the end of this time that we have been face to face with the living God. We ask it in the matchless and precious name of Jesus. And all of God's people say it together. Amen and amen. I don't believe you can be at your optimum without faith. Sports is sports. It's a game. My faith is everything. It's the gas that propels the courage, the truth, 
keeps me going. It is the wind, it's the wings, it's the air that pumps into my lungs that provokes me to live. Faith is everything. That's a quote from Coach Prime, Super Bowl champion, NFL Hall of Famer, MLB great, and now fantastic coach in an interview with CBS 60 Minutes. And in this interview, not only that quote, but many others, Coach Prime made it clear who he credits for his career, for his life, for his everything, both on and off the field. In fact, as he took over the job at Colorado and everybody tried to give him credit for what he did at Jackson State and turning around that program and what he was going to do with Colorado, who had not won a game the previous year, and everybody was trying to lay it at his feet, Coach Prime gave the credit to God. He said, God wouldn't relocate me to something that was successful. That don't make no sense. He had to find the most disappointing and most difficult task. And this is what it was. And this is what it is. And I love that. At the end of one of their great victories, Coach Prime opened up the interview by saying, thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done for me. By all accounts, Coach Prime is a faithful representative of the message and work of Jesus, using his platform to reflect not only the need for diversity in coaching, but even more important than that, to reflect his maker and king, Jesus. And I believe that like Coach Prime, I believe that you want to be faithful representatives of the message and work of Jesus. I believe that. You wouldn't be here. There's a lot of other ways to spend a Sunday morning than sitting in here. I believe that there is more that you want, that you want to participate in a gospel movement. I believe that. You may not have his reach. You may not have his platform. But if you are engaged with Jesus and his people in any way, but need all the other things, I believe that that is a desire of your heart. But there's a hurdle to that, isn't there? In fact, there may be many hurdles to you and my ability to be faithful representatives of Jesus' message and work. I don't know which ones are coming to your mind right now, and as I thought about it myself this week, I, I took myself through several situations where I had the opportunity to be a faithful representative of Jesus' message and work, and I missed that opportunity. And I thought to myself, what is the reason? And, there, and there's, a, there's a thousand reasons we can come up with. You know, it wasn't the right timing. Uh, it would have felt awkward. I didn't want them to treat me weird at work after that. There, there's a hundred reasons. But when I got underneath it, can I just be honest? Can I confess for a minute? When I got underneath it, when I, when I cut away all of the excuses, one thing stood out over every other possible answer. That there are times that I quite simply don't trust the message of Jesus. Is it just me? Now you can dig around for other answers. You can, you can try to find other excuses. But the reality is that when we trust something, when we believe in it, we talk about it. When we think it is of value, when we think it is of worth, nobody ever got engaged in secret. They tell the world. Because it matters, because it's important, because they trust the message. I want to sugarcoat it. I want it to so bad to sugarcoat it and make it easier to hear. But the reality is that we know that to varying degrees, we just don't trust it. Because if we fully trusted the message, if we fully trusted the man, the God, Jesus, then being a faithful representative of his message and work would come easily and naturally. And knowing that this is a challenge, that this is a hurdle, it could, it could leave you feeling guilty, but that's not my goal. Guilt is never my goal. I don't want to, to leave you feeling guilty today. I want to invite you into greater things. My goal is to encourage you that you should have absolute confidence in Jesus' message and its impact on the well-being of humanity. Listen, trusting in the message of Jesus is crucial for the flourishing of humankind. It is the only way to a better future. Politics is not the path. And yet, you know what? If I can be honest, again, I find it difficult sometimes to trust it too. And that's not uncommon. For people even of deep faith to hesitate 
when it comes to trusting that message. Even people of deep faith have moments of doubt. But here's what I've learned. Here's a little hack for you. The more time I spend soaking in the good news, the more likely I am to share the good news. The more time I spend soaking in the message, the more likely I am to share the message. The more time I spend soaking in the word, the more likely I am to trust the word because we trust the things that we give our life over to. If we spend more time with him, then we will be more ready to be faithful representatives of him. In fact, a couple of Mondays ago, I flew to Oklahoma and, and you know, if I could just tell you, it's just been a, a, a busy couple of weeks. This, this last week, uh, I was in, in Orlando, uh, the largest church planting conference in the world, about 6,000 pastors and leaders. Uh, I had the privilege of speaking uh, on the main stage and, and I just want to encourage you, I want to remind you that despite what we might see on television or anywhere else, God's church is advancing. Amen. The kingdom of God is breaking in. Amen. There were 6,000 leaders from all over the world who still believe the good news of the gospel, gathered there worshiping, declaring that they were going to see the church go forward. So I'm a little tired from the travel. A little tired. And, and then I've got to be honest, if I can confess, for I just woke up with a bad attitude this morning. Uh, spring forward is from the devil. It is from the pit of hell. Uh, it is demonic. It is wrong. It is, it is evil in every imaginable sense of the word that we would just give away an hour of sleep for what? For what? Who wants the sun at 10 o'clock at night? If you've got little children, you've never wanted that. You ever try to put a child to bed when the sun is still up? You know what I'm talking about? And they just, they point to the sky. You're like, well, you got a point. Right? So just stay up and do you, boo-boo. <laughs> All that to say. A couple of Mondays ago, I flew to Oklahoma. I went to gain some wisdom from one of the best leaders I know. I heard one of the most shocking statements I've heard all year is this brother with tender heart shared with us that the impacts of COVID on their church had been significant and that over the course of the pandemic, their church went from 100,000 down to 51,000 people. <laughs> I said to thinking to myself, I don't know if we're playing the same game, sir. I don't Whatever league you're in, I'm your premier. I'm La Liga. I don't. But I gained some invaluable wisdom while I was there. And flying out, flying out, the plane ride was pretty uneventful. But coming back Tuesday is a different story. I sat down in my seat, headphones in, headphones in. Everybody knows what that means. That's the international sign of please don't bother me. <laughs> Leave me alone. Leave me alone. One day, all of your toddlers will say that to you. Leave me alone. Same idea. Um, and I was actually listening to the word, so I had holy reasons <laughs> for not engaging in conversation. And then the flight attendants began their demonstration because the planes that go to Oklahoma from Atlanta are so old that they don't even have the TV, so they have to like stand in the aisle and do their thing. And so I, I took my earbuds out, out of respect for what they were doing. And, and as they finished, like as they were wrapping up, I was sliding the AirPod back toward my face. And the man next to me said, well, hey, buddy, what's your name? And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> I mean, I didn't literally do that because it would have hurt his feelings. But that is what I was feeling inside. I had a decision to make had a decision to make. Engage him. Engage him or hide in my headphones. Now, I told you I had been listening to the word. What did I tell you? The more time you spend in the word, the more you'll be formed by the word. And even though everything in my flesh was like, say hello and put in the headphone. Say hello and put in the headphone. You already got Usher Super Bowl performance queued up. It's going to be a great flight. You're going to sit in your chair like this. Just stay in the word. Watch this. Stay in the word. <laughs> but against all of the desires of my flesh, the spirit of God, 
The Spirit of God said, this is, this is a moment that you shouldn't miss. And we began to talk, and, and he was a military veteran. We, we talked about everything from military to motorcycles to football to children. And eventually, because of the way these things go, eventually we stumbled onto the topic of faith. Why? Because when we make ourselves available to the Spirit of God, good conversations become God conversations. And if we are willing to listen, God conversations become gospel conversations. We stumbled into the topic of faith. And, and he began to share with me the things that he was still guilty over from his time serving in the military and the PTSD that he was struggling with and all of the things that he did not feel that God could forgive. And I had the opportunity to tell him that as long as he put it under the blood of Jesus, as long as he put it in the hands of Jesus, as long as he laid it down at the foot of the cross, then God would meet him there and there was no stain that he couldn't remove. That God doesn't see the stain, he only only sees his righteousness. I told you this to preach in mind. I can't even sit down when I'm holding this microphone. I don't know what it is. All the Pentecostal comes out at once. I began to share with him how Jesus changed my life. And how he could change his. When we got off the plane, he apologized for talking my head off. I said, you should have. No, I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> I said, you didn't talk my head off. That was, an, that was a divine appointment. And then he offered to give me a ride home. And I said, well, thank you, but I've got an Uber lined up. And as I, as I said in the Uber on the way home, I thought to myself, had I hidden in my headphones, had I had my way, I would have missed an opportunity to change someone else's eternity. I would have missed an opportunity to see a good conversation turn into a God conversation that turned into a gospel conversation. And so I just thank Jesus for dealing with my knucklehead itself, for pushing me and, and, and the Holy Spirit for his persistence through my resistance. Because there's been several other opportunities like that that I have missed. And they stay with you. I'm going to tell you what I believe. I believe that the fact that I had been listening to the word, I was more amiable to the Spirit's leading. Because I was engrossed in the message then I was more amiable to share the good news of that message. The Spirit empowered me in that moment to be a faithful representative of him. And so the question that I will put before you today is how can you have an ever-growing, faithful representation of Jesus' message and work? Well, there are many things in these Several verses, but I've chosen three that I think stood out to me. And the first one that I want to share with you, and perhaps the most effortless way, to be a faithful representative of Jesus' message and work is to give Jesus the credit. Give Jesus the credit. Look at the text here. Something miraculous has happened. A man who had been crippled from birth is now standing, dancing, leaping in the sight of those who only knew him one way. And so it is reasonable then that the people would stand back and be like, oh my goodness, how did this happen? How did you guys do this? And what does Peter say? Don't look at me. As though it was my power or my piety that made this man walk. Don't look at me. I don't want any credit. I didn't do anything here. His words challenged their astonishment. His listeners, Peter must have thought to himself, must understand that he and John, listen, he and John were not the source of the miracle or the source of the ministry. They had neither the power by the Spirit's hand or of the moral example to claim to have done the miracle, but Jesus did. And so what did Peter say? It was by faith in and through Jesus that this man was healed. Faith through Jesus, verse 16 says, that had given this man perfect health. The disabled man did not need to understand the nuances of the resurrection. 
He didn't need to understand the, the nuances of the ascension. He didn't need to understand every creek and crevice of Christian theology. All he needed to know is that when Peter reached out his hand and said, I give to you what I have, stand up, that in that moment the living God had awakened faith in the soul of this man. That's all he needed. That's all he needed. So here Peter refers to Jesus and everything about him, even the faith that he gives as the source of the faith we display. The point is this, that the first disciples, the, the apostles, they didn't take credit for what they knew the Lord did. And we shouldn't either. You see, when we give Jesus the credit for the good, when we give Jesus the credit for the miraculous in our lives, we create opportunities to be faithful representatives of his message and his work. We create opportunities for good conversations that turn into God conversations, that turn into gospel conversations. Everything you have in your life that is good comes from Jesus. Give him the credit. Give him the credit for those children that you prayed for when the hospital said, it was never going to happen. Give him the credit for the promotion that you thought would never come. Give him the credit for the fact that you are standing when they said you'll never walk right again. Give him the credit for mending your marriage. Give him the credit for bringing your children home. Give him the credit for giving you clarity. Give him the credit for giving you vision. Give him the credit for everything that you've done. Give him the credit. Give him the credit for your home for your car, for your portfolio, for your influence. Give him the credit. Give him the credit. Give him the credit. Because when you give him the credit, when you acknowledge that Jesus is the reason for any good that you see in me, that Jesus is the reason for any blessing I've experienced in my life that Jesus, I didn't think my ingenuity got me there. It was Jesus. Oh, when you give him the credit, you create opportunities to be a faithful representative of Jesus. The second thing we see here is that if you want to be a faithful representative of Jesus' work and message, not only do we give him the credit, but we reject the murderer. Do not choose the murderer. I know that sounds opaque, but stay with me. You see, Peter begins to run down the history of what happened in the midst of their astonishment. He unloads on them in verse 13 through 15. And the summary statement, his abstract would be, you killed Jesus. You killed Jesus. And so he begins to root this reality in the historic work of God. The, the work of God didn't begin with Jesus' earthly ministry. No, it began in history. As he's a Jew speaking to Jews, he says, Remember that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the forefathers of your faith, look forward to this day. But you didn't. No, instead, the good people of Jerusalem who worshiped regularly at church killed the holy and righteous one by disowning him and instead chose a murderer. Stay with me. Instead of choosing the author of life, instead of choosing the crown prince of heaven and earth, instead of choosing the means of creation itself, they chose a murderer, Barabbas. Even though God glorified Jesus, the people of Jerusalem did the opposite, disowning him before Pilate. In fact, Luke tells you in Luke chapter 23 that three times Pilate tried to let him go and three times they said, no, give us Barabbas. We don't want him. Who we'll stay with me. We don't want him. We want Barabbas. But the seeming defeat of the cross actually ended in victory as God raised him from the dead. And Peter and John themselves were witnesses to that reality. 
So the guilt of Jerusalem well established. You have to ask the question, what is the real guilt here? It's not so much they're delivering God's chosen one to death as their denial of Jesus. Here's where it lands squarely with us. God sent Jesus to bless them, but they instead disowned him. And here's where it lands squarely with us. You see, when we choose to follow the flow of the host culture, when we choose to follow the flow of the host culture, we are choosing the murderer and disowning Jesus. When we choose to indulge in our sin, instead of daily putting it to death, we are choosing the murderer and disowning Jesus. When we refuse to speak up about injustices and inequity in our workplace and in this world, we are choosing the murderer and disowning Jesus. When we fail to challenge lies and misconceptions about Jesus and his people, we are choosing the murderer and disowning Jesus. When we lack generosity and refuse to contribute to the extending of the kingdom of God, knowing that eternity hangs in the balance, we are choosing the murderer. And disowning Jesus. You can apply this sentiment in many other ways. But I don't think it's necessary to make the point. The point is don't choose the murderer. Choose Jesus. Don't own the culture. Own Jesus. Don't represent the flow of the world. Represent Jesus. Reject the murderer and select the savior at every opportunity. And you will be a faithful representative of Jesus' message and work. Lastly, today we have the invitation. And again, I'm going to ask you to stay with me. We have the invitation to be a brand ambassador. Be a brand ambassador. Here's the definition of a brand ambassador. A brand ambassador is a person an organization or a company that engages in representing its brand positively, helping to increase brand awareness and sales. The brand ambassador is meant to embody the corporate identity in appearance, demeanor, values, and ethics. You want me to summarize it? The brand ambassador represents the brand they believe in in every aspect of their life. Now everybody knows I'm an Apple guy, period. Point blank. You keep your green bubbles to yourself. I'm praying for you and the bondage you find yourself in. You need to get set free in Jesus. Baruch Hashatanoi. And so in that way, guess what? In that way, in that way, I'm a bit of a brand ambassador. How is it, I'm going to ask it as a question. How is it that we are so easily brand ambassadors for pieces of machinery that have no eternal purpose? Ready to fight over it. I knew when I said it, one of the Android people was going to be, I knew. You got set up. Thank you for helping me make the point. Because when we believe in something, we stand on business. We're ambassadors for our sports teams. I saw a few Falcons hats today. I don't think your draft position is going to change. We, we are brand ambassadors for our favorite celebrities, for our favorite television shows, for our fashion choices for our musical taste. There's an entire internet industry built on this very thing. And if you're going to be a faithful representative of Jesus' message and work, then you have to be a good ambassador for that message and work. And so what is our brand? Can I tell you our brand? Here's our brand. God's love and grace extended to people. 
Our brand messaging is the declaration that God does not want a single human being separated from him eternally. Our brand messaging is the good news that God literally said that if you want to be separated from me for all of eternity, you're going to have to step over my son's dead body to get there. That is our brand. That is our messaging. Peter lays it out succinctly here in verses 17 through 18. You acted ignorantly, but it was God's plan all along. He's about to tell them the brand message. And then he extends an invitation replete with promises. Repent and turn back to God. Repent means to turn away from rejecting Jesus' love and leadership and instead to follow him. Repent. Repent and God will forgive your sins. He will blot them out. God will forgive every wrong that you've ever committed and he will forget them. That's the first promise. Peter says not only that, but here's our brand message, and God will bring times of refreshing to your soul. Now, that seems to have a dual meaning. Don't miss it. Then when we repent, the Holy Spirit refreshes our soul internally, clearing out all the gunk that has lived there for so long. And then because we have been refreshed, we become a soul of refreshing to the world around us, and the world experiences a refreshing by the Holy Spirit through us. The final promise, Peter says, is that when Jesus returns, verse 21, he will come to us as we experience the restoration of all things. Our slate has been wiped clean. Our parched lives are refreshed in the present season by the Spirit's outpouring. Our future perfection is beyond imagination. This, friends, is our brand, and we should be obsessed with it. It should show up in every part of our lives. It should be our goal to make Jesus non-ignorable in our host culture. Because we represent the brand so well. If you're willing to fight about an OS, I'm going to make a cheesy pastor joke. Y'all ready? If you're willing to fight about an OS, then let's be more ready to fight for the JC. I couldn't let it pass. I couldn't let it pass. I don't do too many of those. That was, I, had to, I had to get it in there. It was too easy. It was low-hanging fruit. There's low hanging fruit. If we do these three things, give Jesus the credit. Come on up, Jay. Reject the murderer and be an ambassador of the good news of the gospel and its promises. Guess what? That is the very definition of being a faithful representative of Jesus' message and work. That's it. And so here's my invitation to you today. My invitation to you today is that you would decide to make a difference in this world make a difference in this world by being a faithful representative of Jesus' message and work. And here's what I'm going to challenge you to do right now. Right now. I want you to take a minute and I want you to write down, right now, in the room, not later. Take out your Apple phone and put it in your notes. Take out your Android and hope it stays on there. Right now. See, what did I say? I'm telling you. Y'all better represent Jesus that fervently when you get out in these streets. Right now, write down one way, just, I'm not asking for 12, one way this week that you will be a more faithful representative of Jesus' message and work. Right now, write it down. And then I'm going to tell you, take a second step. That if you're in a small group, share it with someone from your small group. Why? Because once we say it out loud, then the people that we love can actually keep us accountable to doing it. Write it down. And if you're not in a small group, share it with somebody who you love. Share it with a friend. Share it with a spouse. Share it with a prayer partner. Share it with somebody. So that at the end of the week, they can ask you, hey, did you act on that thing that you wrote down on Sunday? And I hope, pray, believe the answer will be yes. The answer will be yes. Listen, when we live as faithful representatives of Jesus' message and work, guess what? The world gets better. Human beings flourish. But more importantly, 
hell is robbed and heaven is populated. Death is reversed. And I can't think of anything better in this world to live for. Father, would you help us? Would you stir our hearts to become faithful representatives of your message and work? Whatever the one thing is that we wrote down, would you help us by your power, Holy Spirit, to accomplish it this week? And for those of us who are in the room or online who are not yet followers of the way of Jesus, my prayer is simply this, Lord, make yourself real to them now so that they see that true life is found on the other side of that good news. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.